Um, I thought a lot about how I wanted to start today's presentation. And rather than just tell you about Morningstar, I'm going to let our global offices and employees from around the world tell you who we are. What's up? Hi. Hi. Hello. 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 Hi. I work at Morningstar. I work at Morningstar. I work at Morningstar. I work at Morningstar. So do I. So do I. So do I. So do I. I don't. Morningstar is a special place with a simple mission to create great products that help investors reach financial goals. Morningstar was founded in 1984 by me. And his name is Joe. Hi. Morningstar's first office was Joe's one-bedroom apartment in Chicago's Lincoln Park neighborhood. He hired a few employees, like him, like me, like her. He began gathering data for Morningstar's first product, the Mutual Fund Sourcebook. This bound publication of computer printouts eventually became the springboard for dozens of products and services, not only for investors, but, but the advisors and institutions that serve them. The entrepreneurial spirit that drove Joe to found Morningstar is alive and well today. And now we are a diverse group of nearly 3,500 people working in 27 countries, such as Belgium, Canada, Singapore, Korea, Thailand, the United Arab Emirates, South Africa, India, the UK, Taiwan, Spain, Brazil, New Zealand. Zealand. Norway, France, Germany, Luxembourg, Japan, Switzerland, Sweden, the Netherlands, Italy, Hong Kong, Australia, China, the United States, Finland, Denmark, Mexico, Chile. Today, investors around the world turn to Morningstar's independent perspective as they make their decisions. We are a creative, passionate, well-dressed bunch. And we are just as intensely investor focused as we were on the first day. Joe launched a business. We work in offices around the world. But we are united by our passion for helping investors. So that's who we are as a company. Um, it's, as I mentioned, um, it's said so much better through all the voices of all of our employees. So. Um, 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 so as I said, I was putting my notes together and giving you all the stats. So that's what that, the video just covered all those points. One thing I do want to spend a little bit more time on is our values, which really drives our social media, um, the type of content that we think about, the way we think about our, ourselves globally and social, is really our mission and our Morningstar values. Investors First drives everything that we do at Morningstar, and it really drives our social program. So, how can we help investors make good decisions? It's threaded throughout our social media content. Great products, great people. Um, great products and great people are certainly another important aspect, especially for the great people value when it comes to recruiting. Uncompromising ethics. In financial services, after the results of the financial crisis in 2008, the financial industry is really still recovering from that crisis and the crisis of trust. Uh, Morningstar was founded in that the idea that investment should be transparent. You as investors here in the room should know what's in your 401k, how to invest in your IRA, what an investment is comprised of. Entrepreneurial spirit gives us, people like me, ability to start things like social media when not a lot of other people are doing that in the industry. And then of course financial success. So how does social media support our company? It certainly supports our brand and our mission in that we are able to share our proprietary research and our thought leadership. Um, the sharing of one to many. Um, one thing that's very important to us is enriching client connections, and that happens globally, and building community around our brand. And then we also see social as a great opportunity to gather market and competitive intelligence. One of the questions that people often ask me, especially early on, we started using social media in 2008 after I came back from a conference really fired up about social media. But in financial services, Twitter, Facebook, all that was very much looked at as for kids, that's not for us, we're serious in finance, we're not going to be on, Twitter, on the Twitter. Um, so over time, I've been gathering a lot of competitive data um, and statistics around our investors on social media. And what we're seeing year over year, more and more people are using social media to make financial decisions. So again, coming back to the trust factor, 82% of millennials would trust a company more if they were on social. 
Why is that important to us as a financial services company? Because it's incumbent upon us to keep building that trust with, with future investors. Um, that's from the Edelman Trust Barometer. That's one of my favorite studies. Highly recommend that. It covers a lot of different industries. Um, five million high net worth investors would, uh, would also make, use social media to make investing decisions. High net worth investors are particularly of interest to an asset manager or a financial advisor. They're people who have over a million dollars in assets. So again, I can say to an asset manager or a financial advisor, yep, your clients are looking for information in social media. You need to be there. Uh, one of the new statistics that just has come out, 59% of institutional investors, and all those are people who make up, who make um, investments, like they create funds, they create ETFs, they create different investment type packages. Um, they're using social media for information. That just came out this year. And then 70% of investors have started or altered relationships based on information that they're seeing in social with their financial institutions. That's very significant. So if you're a bank, an asset manager, um, any type of financial company, investors like yourselves are looking for information in social and changing maybe the types of investing relationships they have with you. So as Hope mentioned, um, I, I started working on social in 2008. At that time, Morningstar was, was a decentralized marketing organization. So people with, were within different pockets of the company executing their marketing plans. So if you decided, oh, I want a Facebook page, I want a Twitter account, I'm going to start a LinkedIn group, all these things were popping up all over. And so we were very messy in social media. And this is just a snapshot of what we looked at when we were auditing um, what we looked like in social. People were using different brand elements. Um, this is actually a product screenshot that's very fuzzy, um, different colors. Um, not because anyone was intentionally doing anything wrong, but it was, oh, I need an icon. I need, I need to do something. So in 2013, we went through a marketing reorganization across the company, and social media was part of that. And as part of that rework, we decided we needed to have one icon that represented us in social, and we also needed to establish corporate um, social media accounts that represent Morningstar as a brand. That didn't exist before either. These other social accounts existed for different product groups, different people. So what the design team came up with is this is our social media icon that you'll see across Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google+, YouTube. And it's very iconic and purposeful to our brand story. Morningstar's logo was designed in 1991 um, by a designer called Paul Rand. And he came up with the idea for our logo. You'll see the O. Um, it's from Walden, um, the last line of Walden. The sun is but a morning star. So what you'll see here is the sun coming up. Um, and one of our other company taglines is illuminating investing worldwide. We want this icon to represent the idea of illuminating investing information, helping investors, and also reference our brand story. So how this translates and how these elements all work together is very consistent. We have the icon um, on our Facebook page. We have a header image that represents a map, so all of our, our global, that we're a global company. We include our, our um, company uh, tagline. And then we also have a reference back to our logo. So all of these things work together in harmony. And you'll see that across all of our um, different elements. So LinkedIn, you actually do use your company logo, and we do use that. And then one of the other things that you'll see here that's because of these changes, um, we have a one corporate company page. That's the umbrella. And then because um, some investment information is more relevant to different marketplaces, we're allowing our country offices to use sh set up showcase pages. Those are still managed by me, but I have people in those local markets who are contributing and managing that content. They're delivering that content in their local language, which is important to that audience. And then there are different investment vehicles that are more relevant for those marketplaces. So right now, our offices in Spain, Denmark, and Italy have an interest in maintaining showcase pages. And as other countries want to pick up on that, we'll expand on that. But what's nice is now everything's under umbrella. Before, these things were happening very in a very disconnected way. Here's an example of a page from our Denmark office. And then just this year, our CEO, one of the things I'm really proud of, um, our CEO joined LinkedIn's influencer program. He's published nine posts so far and generated, he's got over 9,100 followers. And again, when you think about trust in our industry, um, when CEOs are more expressive, more open with, with their clients, it does engender more trust. Um, 
And so this not only benefits us as a company, um, it also benefits our global offices because they have a consistent voice and some consistent content that they can share. Um, we, when Joe publishes a post, our offices share those quite extensively. And the other thing I think is really great about Joe's posts um, is they're very personal and they're very much, if you were to travel around with Joe to the different meetings and the things he gets to hear, he's sharing, you, sharing with the readers his perspective. So he did a series of posts about his trip to Asia and his perceptions of what was going on at our offices and in the marketplace. Um, he covered uh, notes from the Berkshire Hathaway meeting, which is Warren Buffett's holding company, that shareholder meeting. So if you could sit side by side with the CEO and get their perspective on important investing moments, that's what Joe's account represents, as well as hiring and other things that he thinks is important. Um, this is what we look like on Twitter. Again, you'll see the consistent brand um, elements included. Um, and then YouTube um, is another channel. Um, we've been active on YouTube actually since 2005. Morningstar.com produces a lot of content, but we've also improved this presence by um, adding more playlists, so helping people find content that may be more, more interest to them. Um, again, so we don't have lots of different YouTube pages. Um, where the playlists are important. So for example, our commodities research team wants to start a YouTube playlist. So rather than have them go off and start their own channel, we're going to put their content on one page. Um, the only difference in the header, this um, background you'll see in a lot of our videos. So it kind of it references the video content that we're producing. On the right side too, you'll see, again, being able to surface content from our country offices through specific country-specific YouTube pages. Um, and this is the UK, UK's page. So as a result of um, all the changes that happened in 2013, we established a corporate social media team. Um, that's led by me. And um, we have a social media associate who works out of London. And she and I are responsible for communicating with the company what our strategy is, um, leading, people, leading our corporate social media accounts. So anything you see from Morningstar Inc. is managed by myself and Katrina. Um, implementing our design and branding guidelines consistently, evaluating our accounts, and managing all of our analytics and reporting on those analytics. Because social can't happen in a vacuum, it really needs to be a cross-functional, um, cohesive work. Um, we also work with our corporate communications team, HR, legal, compliance, as well as our marketing groups to make sure that our content is consistent and we're sharing the right messages. We also think it's really important um, to equip employees to use social effectively. So we're always providing them with lots of different training resources. Um, we have a social media policy. Um, we have a briefing document. So if someone wants to start an initiative, um, they fill out a document. We publish a blog. And we also share best practices and do training. So in terms of what we've seen as a result um, of the results of this, Consistency plus customization has been a great benefit to us as a company. Again, we're consistent in the social space. Um, our brand is consistent, but our country offices also benefit because they can customize what's important for them. So they're getting support in that way. We're able to leverage the strengths of the different platforms, like the LinkedIn showcase page is a great example. And then our goal is to equip these teams to use social effectively. We don't just let unleash people and let them do whatever they want. We really follow up with them consistently to make sure that they have the information that they need. And then we manage this weekly social calendar. Um, here's everything that we're talking about this week. This is content that you can share in your marketplace. You can retweet it. You can share it through LinkedIn. But these are the main themes, the main pieces of research, the news that's important to us as a company that you can share as well. One of the things we've added to that is not only sharing here's, what hap is happened th here's what's happening this week, but we started actually reporting on analytics. So last week's report, we told them what was going on. In this week's report, we told them, here are the posts that got the most engagement. Here are the posts that got the biggest shares at reach. So that they're aware that not only are we putting things out there, but what the results are so they can see what's effective. Communicate, communicate, communicate. That seems very obvious in social media, um, but I always explain to people, what do we want people to do? What do we want people to know? Let's share that with them. And then as I mentioned, we stay involved in the process to provide training um, as people need it. 
We follow a three-step process at Morningstar since we started this. Listen, create, engage, and we've talked a lot about that this morning. Listening being the first part. You don't just walk into a room and start a conversation. So we really want to understand what it is that keeps investors up at night, what are advisors worrying about, and how can we help them. In addition to that, um, we also listen and respond to our customers. So um, we provide a lot of customer service to our clients, um, whether it's on-site at an event or online. Um, at the Morningstar Investment Conference, we responded to any attendee comment, whether it was the bus service is late, where's the coffee service is empty, um, the sound isn't working in a room. We responded and acknowledged to those clients so that they're aware that we're listening to them and we want them to have a great conference experience. So um, whether it's customer service issues like that or helping them find investment information, we're responsive. Create is one of my favorite things about the thing, what we're doing at Morningstar. There are a lot of places you can go for investment information. CNBC, Market Watch, Wall Street Journal, Money Magazine, um, lots of different media outlets. So what's unique to Morningstar? And that really drives the content that we publish across our platforms. What's proprietary to Morningstar that no one else can say? So that really drives our calendar and what we push out through social. Another unique angle, we host hundreds of events globally. Um, and so we live tweet from those events. We live tweet our, our proprietary web, web, webinars that are based on our proprietary research and see a lot of engagement on that. And then we also look at how can we create um, content through tools like Vine. This year we launched a campaign called My M Star earlier this year that highlighted what it's like to work at Morningstar in six seconds. So again, thinking about that highlighting our great people um, value. So thinking about what's unique to us and how do we tell our story. Engage. This is something I've, I've seen a lot of people talk about in the last few months. Um, Ted Coyne said the other day on one of his blog posts that social should be social. And that sounds very obvious, but as social has evolved over just a short time, I sometimes feel like it is less social. People tend to push stuff out. They're not as responsive. So one of the things that we're focused on, and I think again a unique strength to Morningstar, is being engaging. In financial services, um, most companies, due to regulatory reasons that I won't bore you with today, um, cannot be as engaging with their investor followers. Because we, the, the ink business doesn't manage assets, um, we have an opportunity where we can be more engaging. Um, and so we're always very responsive to our followers. Um, we thank them, we do simple things like thanking them for following us, and you, would, you wouldn't think that people would really care about that, but we thank people for following us and get a lot of response back, and they're very appreciative. We thank them for sharing their comments. If you're gonna share something with your network, you're saying that that's valuable to you, and we, we appreciate that you're sharing that information. We are very responsive to any type of product question or need for information. If, if Katrina and I don't have the answer, and many times we don't have the answer right away, we at least acknowledge that we're sorry you're having a problem, we'll, we'll respond to you with the appropriate information that you need. So that the client isn't just hanging out there on Twitter or Facebook wondering if we've heard them. And then we always seek to create a positive experience out of a negative experience. Um, the screen grab I've got here started off as a very negative exchange with a client who was upset about some information he couldn't find. Um, so we, we acknowledged the problem, we got him offline, I exchanged many direct messages with this gentleman as well as emails. Um, we got his problem to be resolved and I wasn't expecting that he would acknowledge this online but he happened to. Um, gave us a shout out just thanking, thank you to the more amazing Morningstar Inc. social media team for resolving my customer service issue. Like that little high five in social, I wasn't expecting it but it was great to receive and again, um, for me reinforced wanting to create better client, you know, good client relationships. At Morningstar we also, we want to make our effect on our investors, our followers tangible. So we, um, we do contests, we do different things through social, we reward engaging behaviors, if clients are engaging with us, um, we send them shirts. Um, this gentleman here on the left, he's actually a client in Bangladesh. Um, so we'll send our shirts all over the world. Um, just, again, wanting to enforce the brand, create a good brand experience. Um, as I mentioned, Morningstar hosts conferences globally. Our biggest one is here in Chicago in June. And um, I'll get back to this thought, this main thought, but this is our World Cup moment. And I'd like, as you're sitting here, I'd like you to think about in your industry, what's your World Cup moment? 
What's the big thing in your industry? And I'll get back to why that's important. So for us, Morningstar conferences are an opportunity to share our proprietary thought leadership, our unique content, as well as be a hub for the financial services industry. In Chicago, we bring together about 2,000 people um, from all over the industry. As part of preparing for that communication, we've implemented a social media activation document. We use that for events as big as the one in Chicago, as well as conferences that we hold in the UK, um, in Europe, in Asia. Um, we give people guidance around how we want to talk about these events. And we think about them as we want to designate key or lead people, like who are the people that are going to be leading the conversation in social, and communicate that to people at Morningstar. We want to promote the use of the hashtag. I'm obsessed with hashtags, and I'll explain why in a minute, but they, it's a great way to track engagement around an event. And then we want to share key topics and themes. So again, we're equipping people to know, here's what we're talking about at the conference. And if you want to talk about it in social, you can add your own spin to it, but we're giving them a basic starting point. And then in terms of how we prioritize our approach to social, Twitter, of course, is very much in the now. It's what's happening right this minute. You're probably not looking at your mobile, seeing what happened this morning. You're wondering who's talking now about the conference. So Twitter's our now channel. Facebook is later. We do post photos throughout the day. We do post a lot of visual content on our Facebook page, again, to show what's happening at the conference. LinkedIn is after, only because LinkedIn is such a great um, place for long-form content, so for our longer research pieces, analysis featured at the conference. It's a, it's a better consumption method, method a little later, as well as YouTube. We've created a, con a Morningstar Conferences channel on YouTube where you can watch videos from the conference with specific speakers, as well as their sessions. So prioritizing our approach to all of this helps us manage our time and focus. We've been tweeting at conferences since 2009. And again, in social media years, or dog, kind of like dog years, um, that's a long time. Um, and it's unique to the financial services industry. Um, there weren't other people tweeting from conferences at that time. It was kind of tweeting into the silence a little bit. Um, but again, we were able to build traction because we were doing it. Um, our, the great news is our conference hashtags have been a trending topic over this, these last three years, um, which is significant. And this last year, we generated almost 13,000 tweets with our conference hashtag, um, compared to just 1,600 in 2012. So you can see the industry really embracing social, embracing social conversations and use of Twitter. Um, during June, that's when our conference happens, um, we generated a 3.4 million mention reach, um, compared to 943,000 in May. So you can see the big jump in how conference conversations really drive um, engagement. We had 596 different Twitter handles that were tweeting about the conference. And then we calculated a follower reach of 2.6 million people. So again, when I have to answer to anyone within the organization, are we reaching our audience in social? Are we reaching the right people? Um, we take a look at all those handles. These, were, these are financial meet members of the financial media, asset managers, investors, advisors, all people who would use our products and services. So again, we're putting out our thought content to a, a relevant audience. And then as we've grown in our social media usage, we've actually established um, conference hashtags. So we usually, usually use the abbreviation of the event plus the local market. So MICUS is the Chicago conference, MICUK is the conference that happens in London, or sometimes if there's a special anniversary like in 2013, um, we used MIC25 for the 25th anniversary of the conference. One of the nice things about using a consistent hashtag year over year is we're starting to see people will pick up the hashtag. They already know what it is if they attended last year and they were tweeting, um, they'll pick it up again. And then we also we push it through all of our marketing. One of the things I wanted to touch on in terms of a unique campaign and a unique use of content is, um, is Vine. So Vine came out um, a couple years ago we started a campaign related to the Morningstar Investment Conference called Investing Is. Again, it's highlighting one of our core values as a company investors first. So we asked people internally to share what investing is, and then um, got, we start communicating that through social, and then we got financial advisors, bloggers, um, conference attendees to share back 
about what investing is. It resulted in 50 Vine, we started this two weeks before the conference, and once the conference was over, we had over 50, we had 50 videos that were generated with a total reach of over 400,000. And I wanted to show you a couple of those just to um, give you an idea of what people might talk about in, with investing. Um, Bill Winterberg, his video, um, he's a technologist and he did a stop motion video. Opportunity of an unpredictable future. Investing is consciously making the leap from the safe, predictable plans of the past for opportunity of an unpredictable future. I thought that was pretty clever, especially in six seconds. Um, one of our other um, things in social is to talk about what you know. Now, I'm not a financial analyst. It's not my job to analyze what you should or shouldn't be investing in. So it's not appropriate for me to talk about ETFs or annuities or a complex investing strategy. But I, knew, I know shopping, I know shoes, and I know how, now that I'm a grown-up, I know also how to prioritize my money. So when I was thinking about what my contribution could be to the campaign, this is what I came up with. Investing is not about the state of your shoe collection, but the state of your 401k. Investing is not about the state of your shoe collection, but the state of your 401k. So again, tweet what you know. Um, <laughs> and so that, I, I share that with you again, um, to think, because one of our goals is to really change, like how do we talk about investing? How do we, um, how do we make it interesting? Um, and how do we relate, how do we make it relatable? Let's see. Um, so this is where we get into some of the things we've learned from, the, from our years and the tri trial and error. Um, Pat Allen uh, writes, a, writes a blog, she, it's Rock the Boat Marketing. If you're in financial services, she does a great job covering, covering digital marketing. And again, when you think about social aligning it with your company values, again, seems obvious, but it helps you create more authentic messages. And that's, um, her quote here says it better than I could, and she kind of, she got what we were doing. Morningstar supported conversations about investing well before social networking platforms and in print pre-web. Demystifying investing is at the core of the company's value proposition. And that's some of the things that we're trying to do with campaigns like Vine and our engagement on Twitter, and excuse me, our engagement in social. Be a curator. So one of the things we've learned at Morningstar is there's a lot happening across the company. There's a lot happening in social. Where do people start? So our goal with our communications is to really help people find the information that they need, the themes and the content that they need um, to help them be successful in social and share our content effectively. So be a curator. Take smart risks. Again, there is risk in social. There's risk in any type of communication, especially when you open the doors up to um, engagement with your followers. People are going to ask you questions. They're going to ask why you did certain things. Um, but taking smart risks, you know, evaluating how a technology or a tool can help you and how it can help communicate you as a company is, is really key. Um, educating your, uh, we, uh, early on we talked about show me, which is why I showed you the video first. Um, this is something else we've replicated through other areas. Um, early on, um, in 2009 when we first started tweeting and then later in 2011, um, when we wanted, we wanted our advisors to be tweeting and using social, but a lot of them were pretty clueless and also kind of afraid to use it. So we set up a social media center at our conference. If you've got questions about how to use social media and how to be compliant, we've got a center where you can come get some help. Um, we create converse, conversations with our followers through tools like Vine. And then we visualize the conversation with tools like Storify and vis Visible Tweets. Forgive me for the formatting. Uh, Morningstar uses a proprietary font. And when I send it over to some people, sometimes it gets a little wonky. So I apologize for the formatting. I, the, what, the doc I give uh, Hope will be formatted so it'll look a little nicer when you see it later. Um, so I'm coming back to this idea of what's your World Cup moment? Um, as you know, the World Cup, I've got to refer to these stats, but the final match with Germany and, uh, and Argentina had over 32 million tweets, um, and there were 80 ma 88 million people worldwide engaged in 280 million Facebook conversations. And again, I'm sure you're sitting there thinking, like, well, I'm not the World Cup, you know, I'm not even the Super Bowl, I don't, like, what, what am, how am I going to drive those big conversations? But every industry has a big moment. Every industry has something that's important to them. 
And so for us, we, again, we think of our conferences as our World Cup moment. It's our opportunity to get on a stage and share what's important to us as a company, what we think is important to investors. So I encourage you to think about what's your World Cup moment in your industry and really lead that opportunity. Events drive conversations and connections with your audience. And again, it creates a circular opportunity to keep them coming back to you. And this is one of my favorite quotes from Albert Einstein. I have no special talents, I'm only passionately curious. And that's again, I think the heart at social. In order to be successful, you have to really care about what's happening with your audience. What are investors concerned about? What's keeping them up at night? How do we help them? That really drives us at Morningstar, it drives me and what we do. And I think it should drive, drive your efforts as well. Um, I've got a couple slides here connected with Morningstar and then some resources on the next page. But in the spirit of engagement, um, I want you to all check the left side of your seat. If you've got a little slip of paper that says you're a Morningstar, there should be 10 of you out there. Oh, I see one in the back. There's, oh, I see some hands. Um, meet me in the back. I've got um, Morningstar shirts as well as Morningstar bags. Um, so I, hopefully we have some new Morningstar fans. So, any questions? Yes. See you in the middle, yep. Um, you mentioned about using uh, influence marketing, getting your CEO as an influencer on LinkedIn. Yep. Have you taken that a step further and, and used external influencers have you used any external influencers to connect with your market? Um, we haven't yet. Um, my focus this last year and a half has really been to build our corporate social presence um, and to build a foundation. Um, and then as we bring on more analytical tools where it's a little bit easier to identify influencers, we'll think about how do we bring, um, how do we use that data. I was just talking, um, we track all of the hashtag data around our conferences and I was talking with the consultant that helps me do that. Um, we are looking at how do we identify the influencers even that attend our conferences and then share that information with our marketing and sales teams to either invent, invite those influencers to events or special things that would create more, more engagement with them. So we are looking at that, but it's kind of the next step of our program. Okay, I can take two more questions. Okay. Um, I noticed that you said that you have a policy for your employees. Yep. And so I was wondering if you could give some insight into what that looks like, how you came up with that, and also how you use your employees to promote um, information that you have internally that you want to go externally. Sure. Um, so two things. Um, prior, I think it, we, our social media policy was actually established in 2010 or 11. Um, again, that was prior to our uh, consolidation as a company, and our head of marketing services, Kristen Matea, worked on that policy um, with uh, the social media working group, of, and I, I was a part of that group at that time. And she took a look at a lot of different policies across the industry and outside of the financial services industry. Morningstar is a pretty friendly culture. We have an entrepreneurial culture, so we wanted to have a policy that was representative of that. Um, I know Intel, I, th I think it was Intel that she based our, she liked a lot of the components, as did our working group, so we based our policy on that. A lot of it is, thing, is pretty common sense, things, you know, share what you know. So again, my example, I'm not a financial analyst, so I'm probably not, you know, the best person to comment on financial um, information, but I know how to get, I know who to ask for that information. So if someone asks me those types of questions on social, I make sure I get the right information. Um, it's, if it gives you pause, pause is another one of our mantras. So if you're not sure you should say something, then maybe you need to run it by someone else and check with them. Um, don't be argumentative just to try to win the, don't win the battle to, to lose the war. Um, don't pick fights in social. So a lot of it's very common sense. Um, we want people to be thinking about what's appropriate. Um, but it's, like I said, it's very friendly, open policy. Um, and then the second part of your question, I'm sorry. Uh, Oh, how, employee engagement? Um, so a couple things that we do, again, the social media activation document is one of our ways that we engage people within the company, like here's this big event, here's what's happening, and here's how you can talk about it. That's one way. 
Um, and then we're looking at building out other social, like employee advocacy programs, um, communicating. We've posted this content on these platforms. Here's, here are easy ways to share it, as well as equipping our sales teams along those same lines. With so many offices around the world, how do you reduce the risk of having a local office go rogue and set up their own social profile? <laughs> you can't. Um, the Denmark example I use, all of a sudden we had a Denmark company page. Um, so I emailed the people that were responsible for the Denmark company page and, hey, it's great that you want to use LinkedIn, and, but here's how we're using it. So um, uh, communicate, communicate, communicate. I've been communicating for the last year and a half to our marketing organizations, our sales and product organizations. This is what we're doing in social. Um, but, you know, things like that happen. So um, we don't get on people harshly about it. We, we more turn it around as, it's great that you want to do this. Here's how to do it successfully, and here's how we can support you. And that page was taken down within a day, and then we had the showcase page set up. So we have, we have the right things set up for them. Um, it's just a matter of channeling people in the right direction. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for being here.